Well, Tamika, thank you so much for meeting me today. It's a pleasure to meet you. It's a pleasure to meet you as well. Um, so for our viewers who aren't familiar with who you are, do you mind telling us you know, a little bit about you and a little bit about Minding Manners? Certainly. So my name is Tamika Zablit, and I am an international etiquette consultant. We launched Minding Manners in Paris, France about 11 years ago, and the goal was to actually help young children who were expatriates acclimate to living in a different country hmm. and by learning new customs. And... I love children dearly, but I realized I didn't want to spend all of my time really just working with children. <laughs> so I went back to my passion, which is the corporate world. And I realized that over my sort of 20 year career working internationally, what had really helped me, even working in countries where I didn't speak the language, was the fact that I spoke their notion of etiquette. So I think of etiquette as a notion of communication as a language. We learn how to do certain things, what the expectation is, we learn why it's expected, and we can build solid, seamless relationships. You know, as a language, I like that idea a lot. Absolutely. So what would, I mean, what would the world be like if we didn't have etiquette or manners? It would be chaotic, if you think about it. Um, what's so important in any world, and of course it, it has different degrees in different countries, but it's law. So yes, I said etiquette is like communication, it's like a language, but it's also like a law because it's a set of codes that tells us what is appropriate behavior and what's not appropriate behavior. Of course, there isn't a universal code because what's appropriate for one is going to be highly inappropriate for another one, which is why we need to do more research and understand why. Understand history. You know, history sets out traditions. And then traditions are passed on from generation to generation. And suddenly you say, but that's the way it has to be done. And then you question why, well, because that's the way it's always been done. But then you go elsewhere and it's been done exactly the opposite. So the rules help us to build a cohesive social structure. It can help us build cohesive diplomatic relations. It can help us build cohesive business relationships. So without it, the world would be chaos. What, um, why is etiquette so important in the business world? I think actually etiquette is, I don't want to say more important in the business world, but when you think there's a bottom line at hand in doing business. Social relationships, you know, there, there, there are different implications. In business, a company's objective is to increase market share, to, to make more money, to do, you know, have better, strong relationships. And one thing we'll see, for instance, I'll give you one example, going from America to Saudi Arabia as a woman for business. Very different. Very, Very different. different. Whereas in a boardroom in New York or San Francisco or LA, we can be outspoken, we can share our ideas, we can say I. Whereas when I found myself in Al Khabar the first time, I realized I needed to write down my notes and pass my notes to a gentleman who was my on my goodness. team. And it's sort of humiliating, isn't it? Well, and this is when it becomes interesting. It's only humiliating when it's misunderstood. This is the point. So because I understood what was valued in their culture, they didn't minimize my, what shall we say, that the input business-wise, the interest was getting the answer. I had to figure out how to get the answer to them. Again, we're back to communication. If I tell you a poem in perfect Japanese with beautiful syntax and grammar, it's wonderful. Will you be doing that? I might. <laughs> Do you understand Japanese? No. And that's the point. So no matter how beautiful it is, if you don't understand my message, my message is lost. So in business, my job was to get the contract. However I had to get the contract had to be done in a way that they would understand and respect and not be distracted. So I passed the note. I think so, uh, so many people are not that savvy. I think and that's they, they where we choose to be hurt first and yes. not try to navigate exactly. that. You know. Exactly. As far as international business etiquette, um, you say that the art of vision, uh, international business etiquette um, is really about the mastery of the process of editing. I yes. thought that was really interesting. Can you talk a little bit more about that? The edit is about minimizing distraction, again, which I sort of um, alluded to in, in, in the last topic, because we do things that people often find as being 
um, well, quite frankly, a distraction. For instance, in America, we tend to talk with our hands a bit. In Italy, they, you know, we say if you put your hands behind your back as an Italian, they can't talk, <laughs> um, which is beautiful because the culture values relationships. So you lean in a little bit more. You make better eye contact. Um, you go off to Japan, of course, you think keep that space of, of distance because it might sort of um, make them feel that I'm infringing upon their, their, them personally. So it's not necessarily taking who you are and what you are and presenting that. It's taking away what might not be necessary in that given moment. So for me, in England, it's remembering not to move my hands too much because I've seen people sort of do this with their head and I realize they're following the motion of my hand. So I edit by changing my body language. Interesting. I edit with what I'm going to say. That's what I would encourage everyone to do. Don't try to add more. Learn more, take away minimalization, and you, you'll have a much better chance at success. I love that. So you know, one thing I wanted to ask you about is um, just the way that you know, travel technology has changed things. It, how has the ease of modern day travel sort of raised the stakes or uh, created more need for business etiquette? The fact that we can go anywhere today, especially from, from, from London, what I love about being here is it's two hours to anywhere. You know, two hours to Bulgaria, two hours to some parts of Russia, two hours to wherever. And that's a positive, in meaning we can get out and explore and discover new things. The downside is, how much homework do we do before we go? Right. We often go assuming that things will be done the way they're done at home. Assuming that we'll arrive in Spain and get to have dinner at 7 o'clock. Assuming that our environment will adapt to us. And, and this is the biggest problem, absolutely. So I think the travel is, is put more of um, a re reason or responsibility on us to just do a bit more homework. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing I was going to ask you about is, uh, I think you bring up this topic of if, if you don't have time to do that homework and you know you are going for a business deal or yes. some sort of meeting, is there, um, I mean we talked about editing earlier, but is there sort of a culturally neutral approach that I can take so that uh, while I may not fit in perfectly, I may not get an A plus, but mm -hmm. I, um, I at least won't ruffle as many feathers. Yes. We've all heard of the golden rule. Treat people the way you would like to be treated. I want to challenge you to think about a platinum rule which hasn't been written yet. I'll write it one day. I'm intrigued. My platinum rule is <laughs> treat people the way they would like to be treated. And this is really, really important because I'll go back to our notion about Saudi Arabia. There's so much misunderstanding about women in Saudi Arabia. So to go back to the first part of your question, if we don't have time, we all have 24 hours in a day. Right, shame on us. If all we don't. of us, exactly. <laughs> it's how we choose to use that time. And I can honestly say, if it's business or even social relationships that are important, make time a priority to learn a little bit about the values of another culture. Learn a little bit about, should you walk into a room and introduce yourself, as we do in the States? Should I walk in and say, hi, I'm Tamiko Zavali, pleased mm -hmm. to meet you? Which is perfectly acceptable in our community. But in high society Europe, you never introduce yourself. It's the rudest thing in the world. Goodness. You go to your hostess because it's their duty I see. to introduce you. So can you imagine something so simple and so not meant to be offensive, how you could really be jeopardizing any type of and relationship? And really hurt the feelings of the hostess who feels maybe she's not doing her job. Or You've mentioned before that when someone's studying etiquette, the, the what or the things they need to do are often learned fairly quickly, mm -hmm. but the why is often overlooked. Absolutely. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. When we think about why people do certain things, it will help us to be able to go into, as you asked earlier, what's sort of that, that neutral element that I can learn. Understand what's important in terms of a value system. I often like to give the diplomatic sort of example, where if we take working with ambassadors or people coming from a monarchy, we know that there's a certain place in society, there's a hierarchy, and you know that when you address a baron and you're going to introduce them to a duke, that you had better say the duke's name first. That's something I do every week, by the way. I, I figured, yeah. which is why I wanted to make sure I shared this with you and, and, and your viewers. Yeah. Always say the name of the most important person first. That's interesting. Um, that's well, a, it's interesting, interesting especially point. from a monarchical sort of point of view, because everyone knows their place. But when you come from a republic where everything is about equality, you might look at a scenario where, if we bring it down to a business level, you may have a junior manager in a board meeting who has a really good idea. 
and they want to put that idea out there, they can. The vice president puts his or her idea out there as well, and they're all listened to equally because it's about equality. Whereas in dealing in other societies, it might need to be the man who puts the idea. Mm -hmm. It might need to be the elder who puts out the idea. Interesting. We tend to frown upon that and say, but it doesn't matter because we're a me society. Right. Other societies tend to be collective, and it's about the team. The word I doesn't exist in Japan. So when you understand the why, then you understand why you're being asked to do things in a certain way and you don't frown upon when you don't receive the perceived respect you think you deserve because you'll realize they're giving you respect in a different way. And it seems like that really echoes what you were saying earlier about do unto others as, as they would like to be. Well, I don't know, how did you say that? <laughs> do unto others as they would like as, to be done unto. Like to. Done unto. <laughs> exactly. You know, which really gets back to kind of sort of getting inside their head and being empathetic Indeed. to their culture and their situation. So many of us associate good manners or etiquette with this idea of proper breeding, mm -hmm. um, something that either you have you know, growing up or you don't because of your situation. But it seems like your role with Minding Manners is, is to really help those who weren't instilled with proper etiquette uh, and improve themselves and maybe undo habits that they've developed. I'm sure that I have a lot of bad habits. And now, as you mentioned, talking with your hands, I realize that I'm talking with my hands. That's okay. It builds up sort of <laughs> relations. It burns calories as well. <laughs> um, so what is the process or method for instilling etiquette? Because I would imagine it's not just about learning you know, the what and even right. the why, but there has to be an element of sort of practice. And that's in the most important. So when we look at, for instance, let's take it from two different perspectives. Yes, we work with a lot of people who might be coming over who have no sort of background in terms of Western European or Western etiquette, which could be American as well, and they need to learn those customs. But we also think about people such as Princess Diana. She was a lady before she became Princess Diana. She also went to finishing school. So it's not just a question of, of having things passed down in terms of proper breeding to become a debutante, etc. It's about learning what your peer group or your aspired peer group considers to be acceptable. So, for instance, posture. Yes. Yes, you have excellent <laughs> posture. We always tell people to imagine you have an imaginary helium balloon attached to your head. Ah. That balloon is going to lift you up towards the ceiling. Now you know, but what if you don't practice? So what we do is working with people who are beyond the age of 18 years old, we give them the elements in one week of what they need to do. We practice with them during one week, but then it's for you to follow through. It's yes. for you to make that a part of your everyday life. And it can be achievable, it is achievable, but only with practice comes we don't even strive for perfection. We just strive for excellence. <laughs> Getting close to perfection. Yes. And I would imagine it's much harder, too, if you aren't surrounding yourself with other people who at least are appreciating that, it. those things that you're learning. That's exactly it. So your company, Minding Manners, was the first to bring back this tradition of, you know, we talked about the European finishing school. Yes. But you've said uh, recently, I think, that, that it's in a more of ex accessible way. Absolutely. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, you know, finishing school then versus now? Absolutely. As the title sort of says, finishing, it was for ladies, which is really interesting. I won't sort of well, go into it now. But, too, right? but, and I was just going to say, what I want people to sort of go up and Google online the Grand Tour, because the men tour. used to go on the Grand Tour in the 1600s. That was sort of the precursor to a finishing school, where men would go off, especially from England, over to continental Europe and bring back what they had learned. What were they learning? how to get on in society, what was considered correct demeanor as Louis XIV set down with his etiquettes. Finishing school for ladies took place at the end of their high school year, when personally I think they should be preparing for university. But as we know, <laughs> ages ago, smart women didn't get married. So it was this whole notion of being a good you know, lady at the house, being wonderfully domestic, being able to arrange flowers, being able to coordinate the social schedule of your family. Don't frown upon it. I know we have maybe perhaps some viewers out there saying, it's a beautiful thing. Well, I was actually thinking that any man should be able to do those things as well. Well, and that's <laughs> the difference in where we are today. We should all be able to do everything. But who has a year today to spend at finishing school? That's the difference. Um, of course, it was also about being able to put forth the face that you wanted the world to see. Today, what's a finished woman? A finished woman should be someone who has an academic intelligence, someone who has a cultural intelligence. I think it's nice to know how to arrange flowers. It's also important to know how to set a beautiful table. Personally, can I cook? No, but I will be reading your blog to learn how to make a great steak. But I can lay a beautiful table. 
So those are the types of things that um, really just take it to the next level. Most importantly, what we do that no one else does yet is making a finished woman someone who understands other cultures. Interesting. Absolutely. Or a finished man, I might tell you. Or a finished man. <laughs> and I've heard uh, some people talk about technological advances sort of outpacing, uh, I guess, the established etiquette for yes. those things. I think the examples that come to mind are cell phones or email. I think as those arose in popularity, I felt, and I think a lot of other people felt, that there, we didn't really know exactly what the etiquette was for those things. Um, Did we really not know? Well, I think we had some idea, but I think it certainly wasn't being observed, okay. right? <laughs> so what are your thoughts on that? I think we look for excuses, because at the end of the day, whatever the technology is or lack of, it all comes down to being respectful of those around you. So nothing bothers me more than when I go out on a Friday evening and I watch a couple over dinner and they're chatting for about three minutes and then one of the telephones, a mobile cell phone rings. And so he excuse me, so he takes out his phone and he's sort of looking. And you see the lady and she's sort of looking around because what do you do? They're just the two of you. So she doesn't know where to put her eyes. She sort of looks around the room, feels a bit uncomfortable. So finally, what does she do? She takes out her phone. Oh, yes. So yes, it's a different device. But really, the etiquette remains the same. When you're with someone, you are with someone, period. So with the mobile phones, when you go out for dinner, you go to the opera, you go to the cinema, put it away. And that shouldn't be something that even has to be written anywhere. What is important, though, email. So many people have said an email is just a quick note, a quick exchange, and I know that works in America. You don't have to start an email with dear so-and-so, but in Europe, people still do start with the dear. They value that social relationship much more, and an email is treated like a letter, at least the first time. Hmm. Then you develop your conversation and go back and And forth. then the sort of transactional responses back and exactly. is that okay then that is okay. once you've once you've established the, the introduction yes. with dear, you can sort of say, Okay, that sounds good or That's perfect. But I would say I think each we did new that day, actually for this interview. <laughs> we did indeed, yeah. but with each new day, then you sort of restart with maybe the first one being good morning or sort of, you know, hello. One thing if I may I'd like to touch on the Please. business emails. At the bottom of everyone's business email address, you often have your name, your company name, and the telephone number. That does not mean you can sign off by saying, best regards, finished. And nothing. Because you then right. have the name. You still I have see. to put your name. Put Kyle, right. and that tells me that I can then address you by saying, dear Kyle. I see. If you put Kyle Ingham, then yes. I'm going to address you, dear Mr. Ingham. I so see. it's that you wouldn't give someone a business card without telling them your name. That's true, because I have seen emails from people where, <clears throat> from their, the name in their email or from their email address, it's hard actually to tell what their first name is. And then, I, of course, I look at the, the sign-off and say, oh, it's Barry. Or, <laughs> you know. Absolutely. <laughs> That's actually a wonderful clue. Um, you've said that, that good manners are culturally bound. Mm -hmm. And what is deemed right in one country, uh, of course, may be wrong in another. Mm -hmm. So I was just thinking, when I first moved to France, I met my fiancé's parents. You know, in America, we learn to keep our hands on our lap. Mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't was... learn that. <laughs> didn't really? <laughs> no. But we always, when you put your hands on the table, in, in America and England, you have to keep them on your lap. Ah. And we had a cocktail party. It was brilliant. The in-laws, the cousins, the everyone, we were smiling. It was brilliant. Then we sat down for dinner. And I could see everyone sort of doing these things with their eyebrows and looking around and sort of, oh, so no. I thought, <laughs> what's, what's wrong? So later I asked my fiancé, is everything okay? And he said, well... He said, my mother and my sister kept asking, what were you doing with your hands under the table? Oh, interesting. <laughs> so this is the perfect example of what's right in one country. Completely wrong, because Louis XIV, 1700, said, you must keep your hands on the table at all times where I can see them. So for French, for Spanish, for Italians, if you don't have your hands on the table, it's an insult. My goodness. It's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> That's right, because I, I think you're right. I, even though I don't remember being trained that way, I think I would assume that my hand with my napkin in my lap. Exactly. And, so you talk about um, etiquette being a life-enhancing experience, which I can, I can see how it would be. Um, and the benefit to, obviously, a diplomat or an international business person seems fairly obvious, but to the average lay person, how would their lives be enhanced by learning etiquette? It's about confidence. And there's something to be said about being able to go anywhere and know that you'll be fine. Being able to walk into a room for a cocktail party, which just about everyone does, to be able to know how to walk into that room and make a powerful impact, if powerful impact is your objective. 
knowing that there are certain things you can do, for instance, when you hold a drink in your hand. So mixologists. Which I often do. You've made a wonderful <laughs> drink. How are you going to balance two? I'm not sure, but at least if we're holding one, something as simple as being able to walk in a room, pass that drink to your left hand so that each person who arrives, if you need to greet them with a handshake, you're not greeting them with a cold, clammy hand and then having to go, excuse Wipe me. Off, yeah. That's that's not really it's not delivering good. the image that you're trying to, right. to, to purvey. And if you think about knowing, again, introductions, as we said, know who should be introduced to whom. For some, it doesn't matter, but some, it does. And once you get it wrong, well, you've pretty much alienated that potential relationship yes. from the beginning. Dining. Going to a meal, okay, perhaps you aren't going to have a six-course meal with 12 utensils surrounding you, but isn't it wonderful when you actually know how to use a knife and a fork? I promise you that's the reason I got a job in Italy. Simply because I didn't do the crossover method, which is acceptable in America. It's not really acceptable in Europe. And for those who don't know, holding yes. your fork, if your fork is on the left side, you would yes. hold it there, and if your knife is on your right side, you would hold it there and not switch hands, Indeed. right? Indeed. Okay. But I want you to know this is what we educate Europeans on, to realize that, no, we're not very clumsy in America and have to do all this crossing over. And if you want a little historical insight, everyone used to do that, even in Europe. To do the crossover. Everyone did the crossover because it's natural. Etiquette actually stems through the Catholic religion. No one knows that today. We don't realize it came through the Vatican, through the Pope, as he crowned each king of each European country. Of course, the etiquettes, you don't cut fish with a knife because it was representative of the body of Christ. Now, does that matter for someone who might be Muslim or someone who might be Jewish? It doesn't even matter if you're Christian, but that's where the rule came from. Well, you, you did ask me about my fish and chips yes. before we started the interview, and I have to admit I did use a knife you know, you did. To And cut that's absolutely fish, fine, so. but if you're dining at Buckingham Palace and the Queen serves <laughs> fish and chips, then you would not. I see. That's the difference. <laughs> Have the knowledge and not need it versus being there one day needing it and thinking, gosh, I wish I knew. That's a really good point. I like that idea of, of sort of being somewhere and feeling armed to handle the situation, so to speak, um, but not necessarily needing to, to put it out there. I mean, that's it. That's... It just makes you feel a little bit more confident Indeed. in where you go. You know, I, I, uh, in, 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 in being with you, I'd like to think that, uh, you know, when you, when you come home after a long, hard day of teaching etiquette and, and being proper, that, you know, perhaps you shed this persona and that everything sort of goes out the window. Um, is there an element for you of, of relaxing and kind of becoming less proper in your environment? Or would you think your, your friends and family would say that you're, you're just as proper in private company as you are with... Uh, I wish you could ask family. my daughter, because she always <laughs> says, Mom, why don't you ever just relax? <laughs> <laughs> why is the helium balloon still above your head? Do you know, it's a bit like Audrey Hepburn. When you think about, she was a ballerina her entire life, you know, starting very young during, you know, sort of the occupation. And she said it would be impossible for her to slouch. Simply because of what you said earlier, practice. practice. You know, I took my first course preparing for the debutante when I was 15, Goodness. and I loved it. You know, most of my friends did it because their mothers made them. But because I'm always with people from other cultures, it has just become so ingrained in me to always make them comfortable. And your posture conveys so much more than you may think. It tells people, or it, it, sh it makes people just believe. Straighten up as you talk. If you can't control your body, you can't control your mind. So again, working with Asian clientele, it's really important to make sure they know that you have clarity of mind and that posture and feng shui and yoga and all of these concepts come into play. So I'm, I'm pretty much this way all the time. I will admit, only for you, that my one downfall is popcorn. Oh, popcorn. There is nothing like a handful of is popcorn. Is the crossover <laughs> method okay for popcorn? Can you cut your popcorn with popcorn a knife? Popcorn you can eat with your hand. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Good. <laughs> Well, and, and, you know, I think, like you said, it, it does become habit, and that's a good thing because, and, and especially for you, you know, the, the earlier that you learn it, it's much like learning an instrument when you're younger, it sort of becomes part of your DNA. Yes. So I feel like for all those people out there who, you know, are going to learn earlier, that's better. <laughs> what drew you to this line of work? And I'm curious to know what you think you might be doing if you weren't doing this. What drew me to it was being able to go to other cultures and try to find a way to make my mark. I was in my 20s, I'd moved to Europe, I was working in advertising, it was very competitive. And I was determined to, to, to make sure my team was number one. But when being sent off to cultures that I didn't know much about, I realized what made me 
step forward in Japan when I speak no Japanese was the fact that I figured out how to relate with them. So I wanted to pass that on to people, respect others. If I wasn't working in etiquette, however, I would work in health and wellness, which is really etiquette for yourself. Respect right. yourself, right. respect your body, respect your mind. Building those appropriate habits. Brilliant, right. absolutely. That's uh, it. That's wonderful. Well, so just to wrap things up, um, for our viewers who perhaps would like to start being a little bit more etiquette savvy and sophisticated, um, what's, um, what's one thing that you can tell them to stop doing right now, and then one thing that you could have them start doing? That's a really good question, Kyle. I would say stop putting yourself first in your mind. And I know it's difficult in the land of Facebook, you know, look at me, Instagram, here I am, selfies, hit what's behind me. I just me. had breakfast, look at it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's really not interesting. You know, someone once said, you know, people with small minds talk about people. You know, people with average size minds talk about things. And people with a really great mind talk about events. Go out and do something. I'm starting an Italian course at the end oh, of this month. Um, well, it, but it's something little. Do something to enhance who you are. Make yourself more interesting. Be the best version of you possible. That will make you feel better and it will also make the people around you enjoy being around you. In terms of what should we do, I would say travel. It could be a little thing. Yeah, I was going to say. Yes, travel. travel. Now, of course, that's not easy for everyone and, and, and of course we have to take that into consideration. Within, watch the Discovery Channel. You know, read National Geographic. Take your mind on a voyage because that's where the beauty begins. I love it. Well, Tamika, thank you again for, for meeting with me. It's been a pleasure and I've, I've pleasure. learned a lot. Thank you so much, Kyle. Thank you. Hey everyone, thanks again for watching. If you like this video, please hit like below. Also, make sure to download my free PDF guide, 48 Hour Gentleman, your one weekend plan to more confidence, poise, and manly know-how. Thanks again, and see you soon.